the long in the series OPF boot camp. This is the West African boot camp. Don't have your time. You learn a lot, you know, just sit down and come along with it. This is Elaine Bannerman. I'm the founder of the Contact Foundation. Co host, Kessa Kofi. Just has a background in market analysis and is co founder of the online CEO firm, Jalo Thank you very much for taking the time to join us. I hope you can hear me clearly. Um, I just want to come through today's game to be. Um, basically, we have three main sections. We have the emerging technology training section, the entrepreneurship coaching section, and later on, we're going to have two groups of panel discussion. In between, uh, the panel discussions will be on technology tech in the community. Now, in between, um, we're going to have 10 minute breaks. So in those 10 minute breaks, you can get your coffees or you can take your time to do some networking. And um, I'm happy uh, to speak with other people um, if they send me a private message up here on the system. There's only one thing I'd like to say. Um, I'm on the panel of Patef myself. And I read some horrific, well, not horrific, but exciting statistics. Apparently, by the year 2050, the population of our continent will top 2 billion. It will stand at about 2.4 billion. That means that our population is growing at 42 million souls per annum, at 3.5 million souls per month, at 80 babies per minute, and 40% of them are going to be under 50. So this gives context to the work that we're doing with, uh, with, with Pate. Um, without tech, how are we going to feed all those mouths and how are we going to provide employment to all those people? So with that in mind, I really hope that we'll all kind of engage with a sense of passion, the kind of passion that Elaine Bannerman, founder of Pate, um, has always had. My co-host is Lydia Charles Moyer. Lydia? Good morning, everybody. It's so uh, great to be here and this great morning. Uh, I would like to take this opportunity to welcome you all in the uh, Pan-African Tech Foundation uh, uh, for the Western Africa. And you know our theme for today, I think Tetri has explained what we're going to have throughout the day. But just to remind you, I think for the day is going to be the transformation and adaptation of emerging technology in the West Africa. I am so sure we're going to have a great time. We are doing this to assure you we're going to have an amazing time to learn, but also to network. And at the end of the day, uh, you're going to have a great time. Uh, just to take you through uh, the day and how you can navigate through it, just a quick reminder. Uh, if you have anything you'd like to share, please go to the chat. If you can write to us, if you can hear or you have a comment about something, you can use that box. And then we have another that is a QA. and a uh, When we start the, the training, I'm sure you might have one or two questions. So just go to the Q&A and write the question, and then it will pop up to the speaker. But for those who are speakers here, there are a couple of things you can do. There's a place you can turn on your video and turn it off. There's a place you can turn on your audio and turn it off. But also we have... An eye here. You might be on the screen, but you don't want to be seen. So there's an eye here. If you place it and it's not your time to speak, it means you can um, you can you can hide you for a while. Uh, that's for for hiding and you're staying. But then if someone is training and we feel you're excited, you have an emoji here. You can pick what you like. So let's say you want to clap. You know, you want to show anything. Just you know, click. There, the emoji part, and then show us how the training is making you feel. If you're excited, confused, and you feel you need more explanation, uh, we'll be happy to hear from you about that. So that's that's all I think. Um, all the speakers, you automatic. I think once you log in for your time during this call, you'll be here, and we're looking forward to learn from all of you. And just to uh, to highlight you, uh, it's time for technology. I'm really, really excited. I don't know about you, but I think we're going to have an amazing day. Uh, back to you, Tete. Okay. 
So um, it, it'd be great for us to see um, who the uh, it'd be great for us to see who the the the, the leaders behind Patef are. We've already heard from from Elaine Bannerman, um, but uh, let's hear now from Vanessa Abangwa, um, who is on the <laughs> Vanessa. Hi everyone, good morning. I'm so excited about this event today. I just want to thank Elaine for really putting this event on. She doesn't know what she's doing to the community of Africa to bring us all together. So as Ted mentioned, I'm Vanessa Abankwa. I sit on the leadership team and I'm also the startup and innovations manager for Pan African Tech Foundation. I can't wait to get into all the stuff that's going in today. Back to you, Ted. Okay. So, um, do we have Baron um, uh, Amakwatring here? He is in charge of policy reputation management for PATEF. Baron, I'm looking for you. Do not desert me in my hour of need. Is he here? Okay. No, Baron, we seem to be missing Baron at the moment. Yeah. Um, yeah. But... Um, but I think on, on the basis of that, uh, Elaine, would you like to say another quick word about the day? Because you put all the elbow grease into organizing everything. Is there any other steer you would like to share with our audience today? Okay, hello, everybody. Hello, everybody. Um, um, thank you very much. Now, very much. Now, very much. There's a little bit of coming from my, um, my video. Um, well, Pan African Tech Foundation was established because I realized that there's this huge global technological revolution taking place in the world, and Africans seem to be left behind. So, as you can see, one of our teams is Info African Behind. It was very important for me then to set up an African Tech Foundation with a view of making sure that we can educate ourselves as Africans in these in emerging technologies, particularly in blockchain, artificial intelligence, and other emerging technologies. Another thing we recognized on the continent is that uh, there's a, a, a huge, um, there's a growing percentage of youth unemployment, as a result of which we always ensure that we have an entrepreneurial coach in our program, because we are here to encourage the youth. We are here to ensure that we can empower the youth with blockchain, artificial intelligence, so they can catch up to their peers in the Western world, as well as encourage them to innovate and set up their own um, uh, their own companies and their own organizations. And this is why we run an online coaching um, session here as well. So again, thank you very much um, for being here. Uh, I think that what the next thing we'll do is we will go straight into the introduction to blockchain session. So I will be in the background. Um, you won't see very much of me until almost the very end. But um, my colleagues will carry on, and my two co-hosts will carry on and take it from here. Thank you very much for attending. Thank you. So what is blockchain? Is it a block, you know, combined with a chain? What exactly it is? And as much as the word you, you, you can pronounce, the function is about, and it looks like, oh, it's something about robots, technology. Today, you're going to find interesting things about blockchain. Our connection to blockchain and its users is going to be done by Eric Allen. Eric is a founder and of IACASH, but also is a Pan African Tech Foundation West African Subregion Lead. So, let me tell you a little bit about Eric so that as we are going, you know that we are having uh, the right trainer for the right content. Eric Allen is an established entrepreneur, founder of Institute Alarms. Certified, certified YC Startup School, currently undergoing 16 weeks, Conscious Venture Labs for September. Blockchain educator and an African advocate with sense of ideating new businesses and finding market opportunities. Having traveled to 17 countries in Africa over the years, he experienced firsthand various problems that Africa financial system is facing. Eric is a co-founder and CEO of Kubitix Limited, a technology company that offers cross-border value transfer solutions. Eric is also owner of digitalcode.com, a, a cryptocurrency trading platform in Nigeria and Ghana. Eric is also a convener of Pan-African builders 
forum, a community of collaborators on diverse backgrounds to foster mutual growth across continent by sharing the entrepreneurship journey with others. I would like to take this opportunity to welcome Eric for the first training. Eric, you have the floor. Well, thank you so much. I, at the point, I was wondering, um, is it similar that um, Lydia is uh, introducing? Um, I'm, I'm happy to be here. Uh, it's, it's a privilege to serve uh, our beautiful continent and also foster collaboration across the, I mean, the world. I, I always say that um, where we're going to school, um, we're made to think that competition is everything and collaboration has been underrated. And I think we need to begin to amplify the power of collaboration. We go back to our history, which is Mbutu. Uh, you are because I am, and I am because you are. And that's the only way to actually uh, be able to uh, push for um, for the interconnected world we have today. So um, quickly, I'm going to share my screen so we can uh, uh, jump into action immediately. Uh, so um, in a minute, um, uh, quickly, uh, please let me know if you can see my screen. What is shown? Um, okay. Can you see my screen? Yes, yes. Okay, good. So um, this morning, uh, my task this morning, the next 30 to 35 minutes, is to give um, the community um, a background, um, the basic information you need to know about blockchain. I'm not a technical person. I don't code. I don't program. I am an entrepreneur who understands that we can always. Uh, so there was a point in time in the history of Apple um, where um, Steve what, what was near is the is the America's greatest one of the American greatest engineers software engineers I um, mean alive and Steve Jobs and from him co-founded Apple and they have issues as co-founders and Steve Wozniak I mean looked into uh, um, his, um, Steve asked Jobs face and told him hey Steve what do you bring to the table you are not a designer you are not a coder you don't you, you are not a marketer. You, you, I mean, what do you bring to the table? And guess what? Imagine Steve Job. He is a brain behind Apple and his co-founder being the technical person looking to his face and telling him, what do you bring to the table? And guess what? Steve looked into his face and said, musicians, musicians play their keyboard. Engineers code. I am the orchestra. Which means, after all said and done, I'm the connector. I bring all the pieces together to ensure that we have a rhythm for everybody to go. And that is the role I'm going to play today. And that is how that will be our journey. So my, my days into blockchain started about five, six years ago when I, I moved from Ghana um, at the early age of, I mean, 20, 2015, after I resigned from Huawei Technology and I decided to take my, my destiny to my hands. And a friend of mine in university asked me that, look, Eric, let's go to Abuja. I, my father was a, a diplomat in the, in the Ghana High Commission. That Jews are more open to business than we in Ghana we do. So I traveled with uh, my friend Jerry to Abuja in 2015. We, said we went to the business. Unfortunately, getting to Abuja, the government, the Central Bank of Nigeria, in four months changed the monetary policy. So our business was about um, depositing dollar and it's I'm transferring to the company in Singapore and it's I mean, bringing us the, the products to Nigeria. Um, this is the policy. You cannot deposit dollar. You cannot um, transfer dollar. So with just one stroke of a pen, our business collapsed. That was my, my story in Abuja. Uh, a stranger on, in a new land. However, there's one thing that has, has always defined who I am. I'm resilient. I don't give up. So I stayed on in Nigeria because I feel that we are more open. We don't ask you where you come from. You can meet any, any big man, anybody. So long as you have something that is what I mean, more making sense, he'll listen to you. And I can't say that for Ghana for now. <laughs> so I stayed on Nigeria and somewhere in, I mean, in February 2016, a friend of mine I met in a, in a hotel called me, hey, Eric, are you in town? I said, yes. Can we meet? I said, why not? We met and this gentleman introduced me to blockchain. And the whole night I didn't sleep. I was on the internet reading and I turned on a book called the, the Rise and Fall of Digital Currency. The Rise and Fall of Digital Currency, The Seven Disruption, written by Thomas McMurray. It's about 37 page book. I read that book the entire night and I, I became, um, I became like uncontrollably excited. 
And I went to history and I realized that Africa, we have always been consumers from the innovation side. We all wait from the innovator, early adopters, early majority. We always, almost always are laggards. So I said, no, this time around, what can we do about blockchain? And I started my career in blockchain in 2016. And it has not been from too exciting, rise and fall, but in all, we still push forward. So I want to take us to history a bit. Uh, for us to understand what is happening today, it's important we go back to history. So in human in humanity, we've had different era. We've had the cognitive era. We started in Africa. That's why I mentioned the word in Butsu. But Africans have always been about collaboration, cooperation, coming together, doing things together. It is unfortunate that we are we are we are almost losing that sense of collaboration. So I, I decided to um, get us back because for you to understand the what's going to happen in the future, you need to understand your history. History is always good to help you master a mirror. So okay, this is what happened. What can we learn from what ha happened in the past? I believe the blockchain is just a repetition of history. So cognitive era Africa was the center and it was our collaboration. There was a rapid growth in the innovation, social behavior, and it was between human to human, right? And today, and it moved to agriculture era, where also started from the Middle East. Um, it was characterized by permanent settlement, first kingdom, um, population growth, money, religion. So all today, we talk about religion. It started from the second era, which was pioneered by the Middle East, I mean, Middle Easterners. Um, it was aristocratic and kings. Those were the area. And then we moved to, I mean, the, the time of scientific industrial I mean, revolution. And pioneered by the Europeans, urbanization, nation state, cooperation, markets, and the globalization, income growth, and the capitalism actually took a huge um, growth. And to today, we are still in that era. It's kind of, yes, that's the era we are. But we are going into a new era, which is the singularity. I'm being pushed by North America to the entire world. And so we are in a world of interconnectedness. I wrote an article uh, about. Um, the connected economy where everything's connected. You don't say, I mean, I'm in, I'm in Ghana or I'm in Singapore, I'm in um, Mauritius. We are all connected together by our single DNA. That's how we are going. So it's the emergence of connected intelligence, human to human, 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 anything from utopia to human extension. And we're talking of machines, AI, and which um, is rapidly growing. So I want us to have an open mind. Um, we have a history. So we, we told a story. Um, so at one of the university, a teacher, uh, one of the lecturers came to the class and I mean business class, um, and he was like, hey, how many of you here have a um, Facebook account? And well, I mean, so about raise our hands and yeah, you see, these are the boy, bad boys. Um, they have so Facebook. So instead of you reading, you're on Facebook. So immediately I closed my Facebook. I thought it was for people who don't have A. That was it. That was a mindset. How can such be push? And it has made us think that any innovation is something that is going to um, push us aside. But this was built by a young man. And today we all know what it is. But I had that perception because my lecture made us believe that if you're on Facebook, you are, excuse me, you don't have any plan for your life. So I want us to have an open mind about things that we do not understand. If you don't understand, no problem. Take time. Get some document, read up about it, and get yourself. Because the most dangerous thing that I mean in Africa is not bad leadership alone; it is our ignorance, and that that continue to cripple our, our growth. And I want us to be able to have an open mind. So, blockchain. My approach is different. I've listened to different. I mean, I mean, um, I mean, aspect about blockchain. I've, I've engaged with different people. Different people have different approach. But I always want to go about blockchain by relating to simple things around us so that wherever you are, you can be able to understand and look, this is for me too. So blockchain and how it is looked in different minds of the following complete people. So in the mind of a typical developer, a software engineer, a technical person, how, how does it see the blockchain? It's a set of protocols and encryption technology for securely storing data on a distributed network. So to a technical man, a software engineer, that's how we see the blockchain. So if you're a technical person, you see the blockchain as an encrypted um, set of protocol technology that put together in a distributed network where 
no, no one person has access to it, and there's no single point of failure. That's the blockchain in the mind of a developer. But what about in the mind uh, of a business community? So if you're a business person, you are into finance, you're into banking, insurance, you are an ent entrepreneur, how do the blockchain mean to you? For business and finance, it is a distributed ledger and the technology underlying the explosion of a new digital currencies. We have to come money. And in 2008, when we all saw the Lima Brothers, the collapse of the financial system in 2008, a group of people led by Satoshi Nakamoto, we don't know whether it's a single person, a group of people, or an individual, we don't know, whether it's a female, a male, or I don't know. It can be you, it can be Ellen, why she's so passionate about the future of Africa. It could be Ellen who put the blockchain together in 2008. We don't know, it could be Eric, I don't know. So. It is money, and they pioneered it to, to challenge the status quo. Why should money be, be controlled by a single government? Because we know that before now, money, as we know, was peer to peer. It was about um, um, buying from you. I want to shoot your my 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 my, my matches wasting water, and the government came in, took them in fear, used their authority, and said, "Hey, this the money, paper." And this how it, it value and in, in, inflation has continued to um, um, deepen our 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 our, our wealth and, and continue to I mean, make us look more poorer. And in the, in the mind of a technologist, okay, you are, you are technically free. You understand technology. You you are you long at it. How does it mean to you? It's a driving force behind the next generation of the internet. So we have moved from the days of the internet where ITCP um, just a protocol send emails and what I view to a point where we say we are moved from inform internet of information to internet of value. So uh, to the mind of the technologies, the internet is a driving force behind the next generation of the internet. So how internet is going to be looked in the next 10, 5, 50 years, the blockchain in the mind of the technologies is the force behind that. And we don't know how it's going to be. I cannot predict. I don't know how it's going to be. But we believe that I mean, the internet is going to go through a very serious um, 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 change and, and, and the more value is going to be created. So the internet is going to be the internet of value. To the decentralized world, to the decentralized world, how does the blockchain mean to them? It's a tool for radically reshaping society and economy, taking us into a more decentralized world. So we are in a centralized world. So for example, today, if a country decides that you, Eric, we don't like you, and for that matter, you are um, barred from operating a bank account. I can't, I can't do anything. I can have a billion dollars in my account. If tomorrow, a certain government decides that we don't like you, oh, you, 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 are, you have spoken against us, and they decide to put um, sanctions on my account, I can't say anything. If I have money, and tomorrow the central bank of any country decides that, oh, your $1 billion is not $1 billion, it's $1, $1. I can't say anything. That is the world we have today. But we have gone to a point where we have a decentralized economy. My wealth is in tokens. My wealth is distributed to, to a global network across the world. No one single person can open up an issue as fear to say, hey, we don't like you. Therefore, your money is now worth this much. Or, oh, you, you had 1,000 gold bar today. You have to know. No, that's the world we are going. So to the decentralized world, we are moving to a world where no one single person issue as a fear yeah, to kind of um, distort the order of of of, this, um, of of humans. Now, blockchain has also bring about something we call trust. In the last fifty to hundred years, especially in Africa, we have struggled with the issue of trust. It's very difficult for a black founder to raise money than a white founder. That's the truth. Why? It has there's a barrier system there. We have not also organized ourselves very well to end the trust. But you know what? Blockchain is the only innovation or technology in the last 100 years that is not owned by one single person. There's no patent. It's not owned by America. It's not by China. It's not owned by I mean, I mean, um, UK or Europe. It's not owned by um, India. It's not owned by Africa. It's owned by everyone. And it's the only technology that came with its own trust system. So today, I can do business with anybody, anywhere in the world without the person questioning my identity or because you're an African, no. So whichever way you look at it, blockchain has become 
term that captures the imagination and the fascination of many as the implication of such technology are truly profound. For the first time in human history, people anywhere can trust each other and transact with larger peer-to-peer network. In fact, I can I can say without without fear that blockchain is the only technology that has made me to be able to do business with somebody in, in, in US or in China. Right? Because ask me, oh African, African, are you, are you sure you're going to know it? It, um, it can be applied in anything. So we have moved to an, an interesting future, an interesting world where we can all be happy to do business with everybody. What the one thing that I like about blockchain is that the size of collaboration. Right, the, the trust it, it, it has a standard trust, and it gives us every opportunity to collaborate. So for the first time, we can do things as as Ugandans, as Namibians, as South Africans, as Ghanaians, Kenyans, Nigerians. We can all come together and say, how can we use this innovation to change? For example, how do we change the micro marketing system we have? How do we use a blockchain to to generate? Uh, I mean, uh, to, to build a network. To, to kind of create micro housing for the large pool of society who do not have housing, where everybody become an owner to the blockchain, we can collaborate and, and do that. Blockchain is a very complex system, very complex. It's a very um, still people are still researching about, about the blockchain. Even the um, the innovators, I mean the the, 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 the I mean the, the developers, they are still researching. It's a very complex thing. Um, do we have to understand everything before you get in? Find your, your rating, find your, your soft spot. Whether you're, I mean, you're a finance person, you have a way to go. I mean, you can go through the, um, I mean, the currency aspect of it, or you can build a trust system, identity, or there are several things. It's a very complex system that the world is yet to even understand. Um, perspective of the blockchain, it, it, it calls into question what might have seemed to be established parameter of the modern world. Like currency, economics, trust, but exchange. So the blockchain is also the only innovation that also came with its own currency. So today we can tokenize everything, including artwork, including your, your crafts, including your, your own, if you can even tokenize your own hats, your body, everything. That is the power of the blockchain. It also brings us an equitable world. So today we do not have and an economy who will say, oh, I'm better than you. Like I said, it's not owned by anybody. So the blockchain provides an equitable world where every human being can feel part of an economy. But money rules the world. And if you can all be, be very, very, very intentional, the sad thing is that there was a research that I was reading last week. It's, it's sad that even um, America and Europe, they are, they are doing well, but China is actually owning a lot in terms of investment, they are, they are sovereign funds, they are an individual, I mean, worldly people are investing so much into innovation, the technology for the next 50 years to come. Africa is zero. So, how do we say the blockchain provide equitable world? Yet, we are not willing to kind of um, invest in our innovators, in our entrepreneurs to create solutions, to create um, business that will empower our young people who are, um, are looking for opportunities. Now there's a confusion, right? Today you hear a banker talk about DLT. Tomorrow you hear a software developer talk about blockchain. Tomorrow, I mean, and the next day you hear um, um, a shipping line talk about DLT. So um, the, these words have been used interchangeably, but they are not the same. Matter of fact, DLT is the model. DLT is the base. It's a universal. Blockchain is a subset of DLT. DLT has been there. I mean, before blockchain was um, eventually invented, DLT is an old innovation that's been there. It's a record of consensus. So DLT is the, the, the grand, grandfather. Blockchain is the son or grandson. So it, it's a technology that has been there for a very long time. Blockchain is an improvement of DLT. And blockchain is the one that has really, really um, challenged the status quo and continue to challenge the status quo and doing amazing things. Miracle things are happening with the use of the blockchain. So in all, I'm just, just showing you how the, I mean, the power, power of DLT. So that is the thing. So next time, don't, don't interchange it. They are not the same thing. Blockchain is, is a part of the DLT family. But blockchain is the most popular and the most uh, destructive um, element in the DLT uh, uh, world. Um, so uh, we cannot talk about blockchain without giving you um, the, the differences, right? There are differences. There's a public blockchain and there's a private blockchain. So with public 
blockchain. Example is Bitcoin blockchain, which was invented in 2008 and went live in 2009 with the first um, block um, um, mine. So, I mean, that's it. Basically, it's an open blockchain or permissionless blockchain and public blockchain with special permission. Um, special bankers or central banks, you hear about um, CBDC, they are all going to be built on permission blockchain. It's not going to be open like um, Bitcoin or Ethereum. It's going to be private, it's going to be permission, you have to be permission or you have to be authorized to be able to use it. So that's a major two differences between blockchain. Permissionless, example, Bitcoin, Ethereum, and the likes. Permission blockchain, which not, I mean, I would use the central bank. So the central bank, all the noise they're making, their blockchain or their innovation, they are building their central bank, central, I mean, the currency is not going to be, a, I mean, a, a permissionless or public. It's going to be permissioned. It can be open to everybody, but authorized. You need to have authority to have. So still, the question about it, um, um, to, to how people trust, is also something that we have to we can talk about it. It's debatable because if in the last 100, I mean, 50, 100 years, central banks have not been too transparent, and um, what is a guarantee that we be using um, uh, blockchain innovation to build the all CBDC? Um, we can. So it's, it's, I'm, I'm not the one to. Uh, to create this uh, this um, uh, uh, conversation, but I I know there are several millions of people that are also questioning um, the, the the intention about CBDC being pushed by the central bank. So as of 2019, there were over 800 blockchain um, different blockchain projects in the world. Popular among them is Bitcoin blockchain, which is the first, the mother, and Ethereum. As I speak, there are over a thousand different blockchain projects. Popular ones again, Stellar, Neo, EOS, Dash, Tron, Polkadot, Solana, um, um, Cardano, which was one of the most my, 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 one of my favorite blockchain projects. Um, so there are several blockchain projects um, that has been built after Bitcoin over over eight hundred and twenty nineteen today. Um, the data, I mean, I mean, it's more than eight hundred um, um, so far in the world. Um, so I'm going to I mean. Um, highlight of focus zoom on Bitcoin blockchain. Why is the Bitcoin blockchain so unique? Why is the Bitcoin blockchain so 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 as interesting? So if you hear Bitcoin and you see the writing in, in, in small letter, that's the currency. When you hear see Bitcoin and the the writing um, Bitcoin is in capital, that is the blockchain. So Bitcoin is a blockchain and its currency is Bitcoin written in small p. So the Bitcoin blockchain is very interesting. It is very, it's mutable. In fact, it's the most decentralized I mean, um, blockchain technology. Because it's the first, we don't know who invented it. All other blockchain projects, Ethereum, we know who is behind it. Dash, we know who is behind it. Um, Adak, I mean, Cardano, we know who is behind it. But for Bitcoin, because it was the first and it was a disruptive innovation that challenged the status quo, challenged the current financial order. Of course, we know um, 1998, Liberty Reserve, they also try to I mean, issue a kind of uh, digital currency or e currency. We know what the central, I mean, the American government did to them. So I think lesson again, history. I mean, I mean, we're glad with I mean, the, the, the guys that were building um, the Bitcoin said, look, we are not going to show our face. Let's be, uh, be anonymous and ensure that the world gets something that they will be happy about. So Bitcoin blockchain was big for the world, it was big for anybody anywhere in the world. Or so long as you have access to the internet, you can use. Uh, become a part of the Bitcoin um, 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 uh, economy. It's permissionless, it's borderless, it's censorship resistant. Nobody can censor you. Like I mentioned, the CBDC being pioneered by different governments all over the world, it can be censored. That's the truth. But Bitcoin blockchain, nobody can censor you. It's censorship resistant. That makes the Bitcoin blockchain very interesting. Very interesting. So you want to take up I and mean, you look at the Bitcoin blockchain um, um, white paper, it's about 27 page documents. No, it's about nine page document or so. Please just Google it, Bitcoin.org or Bitcoin and white paper, and read it. The more you read it, the more exciting you become. The more interesting it becomes to you. The more you want to delve deeper because you read that for the first time in history, human beings are going to get their freedom back, freedom of, of value, freedom of movement, freedom of speech, freedom of I mean, economy, and every other thing. So the Bitcoin blockchain is an interesting. Um, innovation that is for everybody. So it's the premier. It's public. It's open to everybody. It's peer to peer. Peer to peer means that I can send you more value 
whatever you have on the planet, so long as you have Bitcoin wallet, um, it's distributed, it's secure, and it's reliable. I want to put on this table that nobody has ever had the Bitcoin and the blockchain. However, your wallet can be hacked. If you compromise, your, your password is compromised, or you forget your, I mean, your, your, I mean, your access code, you can be hacked on your wallet. At the Bitcoin network itself, you need to have 50% or more to be able to change uh, the, 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 the consensus uh, um, um, algorithm. That's difficult to do, all right? So it's the most reliable innovation ever. And now, I mean, I mean moving fast to some of the applications, like I, I mentioned, I've listened to, um, so if you go on TED Talk, um, Talk is one of the most profound uh, uh, authority when it comes to um, cryptocurrency blockchain. And he's giving several, several, several um, uh, talk about blockchain. So Bitcoin um, blockchain can be used on different, different, different parameters from fintech, retail, business, consumer to consumer, apps, and different things. R and D. Now there are several huge. IBM is part of a big consortium building a, a public enterprise blockchain, or we call the enterprise block blockchain. IBM is part of them. Um, so it's an interesting area you want to also pay attention to. Chain analysis, there's a company there called Chain Analysis. Now, if they are very interesting people that I, I want us to pay attention to them. They have, they, are the, um, they have built a forensic system that enables us. So we hear people say, oh, Bitcoin is used for fraudulent activities. Oh, cryptocurrency is fraud. People used to do money laundering. I want to put it on this, I mean, on this, I mean, day that look, the biggest means of fraud, of money laundering, is the US dollar. Not, not cryptocurrency. The biggest avenue for fraud, for money laundering, is the US dollar. In fact, it's fiat currency. As I speak to you today, the ransomware that happened in 2018 or so, I mean, I mean with the help of channel analysis and, 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 and analytics, they, are, I mean, they, they were able to track them and, got, and, 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 and capture them. So channel analysis has built a system that today, if you receive a Bitcoin, that is problem Bitcoin, I mean, they can track you. So it can, it's traceable, it's, and yet it's pseudo anonymous, meaning that you can, you can know who is behind it, you can track it, it's, also, it's so totally not anonymous. There are dark um, cryptocurrency like um, um, and, um, Dash and Co or Monero. They are, they are very private, that is very difficult to, to know who is behind it. But Bitcoin is not that anonymous, it's pseudo anonymous, meaning that I, my identity cannot be refused immediately. But as so long as I send it to my wallet on exchange, because on exchange, I have two KYC, they can track and know that it is Eric who used this Bitcoin to do this for. So let's I mean, be guided that Bitcoin is not used for money laundering. Yes, it, it, it has been used, but the percentage may not be up to the quantum of laundering I mean, the US dollar is being used for. So we need to get that I mean, clear in our mind. There are more applications. Um, so banking, manufacturing, um, professional services like accounting, um, auditing, uh, as I, I speak, um, the price water and school fees, um, 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 KPMG, they have invested so much into um, I mean, building identity on blockchain, which is going to be future. So digital currency, data asset sharing, data currency, identity protection, Payment, land registry, especially land registry in Africa. I, I remember that I bought a land from a friend that I trusted, seven thousand dollars, two years, three years ago. I sent him the money. I came down to check the land. I saw the land in, in, in less than three months. Someone had built on the land. My seven thousand dollars gone. Imagine that land was registered on the blockchain. No, no single person can, can do that to me. But today, I've lost that money. Why? Because one land can be sold to thousand people. Because I mean, we, we are not credible, we are not honest, and the system is, is in the mess. Blockchain can provide that op opportunity to, to put all our land title on a blockchain, such that no one single person can alter the authenticity of the original document. Or in the university, if my, I said I went to Harvard, how do you prove that? But with a blockchain, you can prove it to know that indeed I went to Harvard. My certificate can never be duplicated. So that is the future the blockchain providers. Um, at this stage, I uh, will dive into some of the popular use of cryptocurrency, I mean blockchain. It's cryptocurrency. Why? 
is money. And people are interested in Bitcoin money case, or money rules the world. And that's the truth. And so the most popular use of the blockchain has been cryptocurrency or digital currency. And um, the large, I mean, so Bitcoin, Ethereum, is, I mean, cryptocurrency. And today we have also moved to another area called NFT, which is a, uh, it started somewhere in 2015, 2016, but now it's very popular. So we are talking of um, arts, artwork, uh, people who are crafts, who have crafts, who have skill, like musicians, um, um, painters. You can actually tokenize your artwork through the NFT platform. So non fungible token is very popular. So some of the platforms that are Chief, Big, Organ, and other view, the most popular marketplace for 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 uh, for NFT is um, uh, OPC and, and what have you. OPC is one of the biggest um, um, market where you can tokenize your art, your craft, your voice, whatever you you have. You think that it has value, you can tokenize it and sell it, and the ownership can never change from from you. And then we have the DFI. So the DFI is purely credit. Today, the banking system that we have today, for you to assess finance or credit, bring that, bring this, bring that, bring that document. Blockchain has eliminated all those bureaucracies. So you can easily assess a loan on a DFI community. You can assess, I mean, I mean um, credits, you can assess funds on a DFI um, system. People can provide liquidity right, by funding the system. So DFI is another big arm of the blockchain innovation in the in the also in the banking sector because money rules the world and whoever can control capital control the world. So again, DFI is also challenging the status quo about credit, about liquidity provide provision, about um, um, loan giving loan and providing as a liquidity to their interest. This is where DFI can, can come strong. And then gaming, of course, gaming is a huge industry in the world. We all know. The, 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 the gamble in and the casino. So in blockchain, so yes, there are platforms that are also disrupting the, the manual gaming system that we have today. And of course, in the, the blockchain cryptocurrency world, we can also call the memory. Uh, they are, excuse my language, in, in code, they are called shit points. They are projects that are, are, are pushed by sentiments. They are projects that are not necessarily um, doing, I mean, solving a particular problem, but they are moved by people's emotions. So example is Dodge. So Dodge was created in 2014 as a as a as a, as a side side chain. Just I mean the guy was just playing and he just created it and he left it. But today Dodge has become one of the most successful <laughs> projects and has made people over nine millionaires. And you have a shape, you have so these are the memory. They are they are very controversial. So if you want to go in there, you need to do your own I mean research very well. You can lose everything, but you can also and um, overnight become very successful with those things. And of course, we have the Internet of Things and uh, blockchain project and VET. Um, uh, I'm thinking by, by it, um, IOTA. IOTA is an interesting Internet of Things blockchain project, which is still undergoing uh, I mean, it's, um, different um, research and different um, 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 IT process. Um, then, if you have cryptocurrency, how do you store it? Do you go to a bank and say, I have Bitcoin, this is my Bitcoin? No, you don't hold Bitcoin. You don't you don't touch it. It's virtual. It's it's it's, 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 it's a code. It's called money. So how do you store it? You store it on a wallet. So the wallet is your bank. In, in the real world, it's your bank. Your fiscal banker, you go, you put your money, and then the bank protects for you. So your, your wallet is your own bank. So in a in the future, each one of us is going to be its own bank. You're going to be your own bank. You have, you have your own liberty, and therefore, if you want freedom, freedom comes with responsibility. You need to be responsible for your own um, um, financial um, awareness. You need to be responsible for your own custody. And therefore, you need to be aware which kind of wallet you have to use. Do I use pop wallet, desktop wallet, mobile wallet, web-based wallet, PayPal wallet, code wallet, steel wallet, hardware wallet, or exchange? Whatever you choose, you need to do your own due diligence and be sure that you have personal responsibility for that. So freedom. Come with the responsibility, and there are several wallets. Um, which one is my favorite? I don't know, I don't have a favorite. Depending on, on my mood, I have which one I use. But you, as an individual, Africa, we always want someone to do something for us. I, I, I want to put on this record that if you really want to take position and do something significant with the blockchain, we need to be responsible, we need to take personal responsibility, we need to do research, we need to read. Let's stop 
I mean, and this idea that, oh, if you want to hide something from an African and put in a book, that is for the old, it's for the old school. In this modern world, you cannot continue to be in that, in that perspective and, 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 I mean, go ahead and then read your stuff. And the last five years, Africa is positioned. The use of cryptocurrency is growing faster in Africa. Nigeria is leading, um, Kenya, even Togo. In fact, according to chain analysis, in the last 12 months, the use of cryptocurrency in Africa has grown about 1,200% in the last 12 months. Why is it so? For us in Africa, blockchain cryptocurrency is not a nice thing to have. In the West, blockchain cryptocurrency is a nice thing for them. But in Africa, it is helping us to hedge against inflation. In Africa, it's helping us to make payments seamlessly. I can mix up a payment to someone in Kenya within a split of a second without going to a bank using cryptocurrency. Before now, it was not so. It would cost me about 10% minimum. In fact, remittances is one of the major use cases for, um, for, for crypto adoption in Africa because the existing systems, uh, Western Union, MoneyGram, and on average, according to UN, the, the, the data is there. It costs more, three, three times much more to send money to Africa than to send money from America to, um, to Canada or America to, to UK. It's not it's unfair. Africa paid an average about, about 4.5% on, on, on the current system. But with the use of cryptocurrency, which is young people, again, um, Mr. Kofi gave a very wonderful statistic. Yes, Africa, um, 1.4 billion people, 65% being young people between eight, eight ages of, I mean, 15 to 20, 19. Incredible, agile, smart, knowledgeable, skillful, talented. These guys want to have their freedom. These guys want to experiment. These guys know that the system has not created hope for them. They know that with their skill, with their, I mean, their technology savvy, they can become their own. And therefore, the adoption is being driven by these young people who actually, their wealth is being stored on, on cloud. We don't care why our government all of Africa has not had any plan for the young people. And blockchain came to save these young people from hopelessness. And therefore, the adoption should not be surprised to you. This young, agile, smart, uh, daring, more, 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 more adventurous people are using cryptocurrency for their businesses, for remittances, for paying their, their, their fees. I mean, becoming, I mean, community managers. In fact, it has created more jobs for Africans than any government has done in the last five years. That's what cryptocurrency have done for Africans. And therefore, you should be surprised that Africa is leading the way. My conclusion is very simple. I'm almost done. Blockchain may be used to support organizations in multiple ways, rather than just serve as a peer-to-peer -peer payment mechanism. Blockchain has presently evolved from the internet of money to the internet of value. So we are in that era. Aside Bitcoin and Ethereum, which are open, public, and permission, other types of blockchain exist, such as permission, private and closed. Example, CBDC. It's a permission, it's private, it's closed. Consortium, blockchain, such as um, Coda, Coda blockchain is a consultant blockchain and an enterprise hybrid blockchain. Um, each blockchain can serve different purposes, obey different rules, and employ different protocols. Each blockchain has its own advantage and disadvantages. As for those, you have to go and do your own research. But in conclusion, all I'm trying to say that blockchain is not an animal. Whether you are a farmer, you are an engineer, you are a, a journalist, you are into business, you are an entrepreneur, you are a banker, you are a government official, blockchain is here for you. Let's look at the blockchain from a point of, uh, of optimism, hope, and inspiration to change out the course of our, our, our humanity. I will end by just saying that Africa can actually change our economic situation today. Because I, for, for me, I don't even understand why I'm in Africa and everything is in dollar. I go to, I mean, shops and pick things are put in dollars. I have cities. So if you don't if you, if you don't want our city, why don't we just collapse our local currency and just say we are spending dollar? But if we still believe in our currency, for money is driven by hope. Money is driven by trust, confidence of the people. So if you're in Nigeria, you're in Ghana, you're in Kenya, and everything you're pressing in dollar, how do you expect your currency to have value? How? So the only way we can solve this, to travel, today we have African Continental Free Prison Area. I don't know whether it's a lip service or we are serious about it. If you are serious about it, we can actually decommission de de the dollar in Africa by tokenizing our currencies to talk to each other. 
That was the solution my company, my previous startup was trying to solve, which we, we piloted Ghana and Nigeria and, and transacted over $1 million without marketing. What did you do? We built a wallet using the Stellar blockchain, where we tokenized the Nigerian Naira and we tokenized the Ghana series. So if you're in Nigeria, you want to send money to Ghana, you load your Naira on our wallet. You immediately convert, you can swap it to cities, and then you send it to the person in Ghana within a second. And the person will receive it in small money, Momo, or in the bank account, in a second. And it, I mean, the fee was just less, was less, less than 2%. 80% cheaper than you would have paid to Western Union. 90% cheaper than you would have paid to MoneyGram. And in terms of days, time wasting, it was 1,005% faster than MoneyGram Western Union combined. Because within, a, within three seconds, the money gets to the person to, I mean, to use or whatever you want to use. So for me, I think that Africa will have real opportunity. Just as we're able to refer from landline to mobile phone, and they also show the West that yes, you gave up mobile phone, but then we can use the mobile phone to create our bank account. And Mobile started in Kenya, where MPESA, the most successful open money um, innovation, pioneered by Africans, has been. I think we can use the blockchain to redefine economic order. We can use the blockchain to redefine our public system, our data system, data identity, I mean, personal identity, banking of operation. Um, Insurance, farming, so we can have better inputs and better product uh, in terms of um, pharmaceutical. A lot of feedback come to Africa. If you can use the blockchain to track from the manufacturer to the pharmacy to the last person, we will be able to reduce fake drug drugs that come to Africa by ninety percent. I would just want to thank you very much uh, for this opportunity, and um, I will just end by saying that my area of focus is on blockchain. Startup advisory. I also advise entrepreneurs and have one of the biggest um, um, platform where entrepreneurs all over Africa come together and we share ideas. I'm currently uh, building uh, an uh, IA, it's a big marketplace where we want to connect African freelancers to the global marketplace so that these young people, 65% of our population, cannot be left uh, uh, uncharted, cannot be left without job. We need to create, but they have the skills, they have the talent, and we need to. Offer their talent to the global market, please. On this one, I'll see you and if you have any questions at this moment. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eric. I mean, this has been an amazing session. And because I want to find out how you feel about the session, if you really uh, uh, enjoyed the session, please give me a thumbs up in the emoji part. Give me a thumbs up. Yes. And if you think you have increased your knowledge today and skills around uh, blockchain, please give me a clap. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so we we've heard much from Harry. And if you have any quotes that you have, you 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 got it from the session. Please write it in the chat. Anything exciting? Anything that you've liked from the session? Write it there. So now I want to invite someone to have a conversation with Harry. I know Eric has been training us for like I don't know fifty minutes or forty minutes. So I want to invite someone, and he and Eric are going to have like a conversation around blockchain. Uh, I would like to invite Erwin uh, on, on the stage. Erwin is uh, a project expert and blockchain specialist who has vested interest in cryptocurrency and technology. Actually, he's a decreed director of software testing factory of Societal General Bank of Sub-Saharan Africa, where he works on RPA and autom automation subjects. He is cryptocurrency and blockchain evangelist who popularizes those technology and got the board. Uh, let me take this opportunity to welcome Erwin uh, to have a conversation with Eric. Um, you're welcome. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Eric, because uh, your presentation was very, very, very clear and amazing. And I think that uh, we both have uh, the same love for, for blockchain. And uh, I think like you, that blockchain will be the technology of this decade because this blockchain can disrupt many, many uh, sectors, economically, economically speaking, like finance, uh, payments, identity protection, like you said, and uh, supply chain, etc. And I think that the key principle, there are key principles in uh, that are connected to blockchain, such as transparency, decentralization, which on the surface can address many of Africa's challenges from election, international remittance, 
as well as energy services and alternatives of banking. Africa has many um, developing systems that could benefit from this technology. And your presentation was focused on these, uh, these benefits. And I think that it's really, really amazing. And uh, what I can, what could I say? Uh, I, what can I say is that uh, blockchain is a huge opportunity for Africa. And uh, I mean, uh, what is the thinking uh, about, uh, for example, the, the use case that have been uh, made into Africa, like Bitland in, in your country, uh, in Ghana, and uh, the election that have been made in Sierra Leone on blockchain? What are your thoughts about this? Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Erwin. Um, so I want to say, I mean, take it this way. For me, as an African and um, being born on this soil and knowing that there are several challenges. Um, oftentimes, you hear people talk from the point of, 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 of the past in terms of pain. How do we change our trajectory? How do we change the narrative from a point of scarcity to a point of abundance? How do we say, look, in the last 50 years, we've, we've not been able to inspire hope. How do we harness innovation that we have today? I'll, I'll tell you something. When mobile phones started, right, um, in Ghana, um, and MTA, for example, Ghana had its own telecommunication uh, network called um, Ghana Telecom, where we sold it to Vodafone. Mm -hmm. And guess what? MTA came, and in less than 30 years, mm -hmm. um, MTA had built a massive network. And in 2009, I was part of the young people who tested MTA mobile money. In 2009, Ghana um, Community Bank didn't give MTN a seat to have a meeting because they didn't understand it. So more money. Today, MTN has built a, a bigger, in fact, their revenue for this year alone is run to a billion dollars already. Yes, yes. This is just one arm of it. Now, my, my core approach to our system, we always of the I mean, Africa is, is poor. Africa is not poor. Africa is corrupt. Yeah. I was going to say that corruption is relative, right? The reason why we see that corruption very, very effective is because we are we are we don't have bigger mind, we don't have the bigger vision, we are not ambitious, and therefore you steal money from your country and then you go and, and put it in Switzerland. Yes, yeah. Switzerland, yeah. that money is not going to be lined up, they will give it to their sovereign fund, their pension fund, and they will lend it to their entrepreneurs, and the entrepreneurs will create. And then this big giant will bring it back to Africa and we consume, right? And then we go back and take this money from British youth institution as a loan. And then we pay with the people that are not born. Have you ever heard that a politician in America, you think they don't steal their money? You think they are not corrupt? You think I'm a mean, British are not corrupt? And you think Chinese are not corrupt? You think they are not? They are. Yeah. But they have something they call spreading of greed. They, 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 they spread wealth, they create wealth. So they will steal and they will know you their faith. They will go and invest in Silicon Valley Bank. And the Silicon Valley Bank will invest in the likes of Elon Musk, Mark Zuckerberg, um, Peter Thiel, and co. to create the Google, the Apple, the Facebook. And then they will generate more revenue and they will employ more people. So I want us to begin to look at if we don't trust our young people, no problem. Government, we are not going to fight you. We don't want to be president. We don't want to be minister. We don't want to be um, MP. All we are saying is that create an enabling environment. Create an environment where young people can thrive. And if you're a hub, like we have in Silicon Valley, you have um, in China, they have um, Silicon China. If you go to um, London or UK, they have Canary Wealth, where innovation are, be, are, are being sponsored by government, by co in, 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 co I mean, corporation, because there's the system guiding it. All we are looking for, coming all over Africa, create an enabling, stimulating policies. Yeah. Perhaps if you can give a foreign country 10 years tax waiver, why can't you give a young man who has just started an entrepreneurship 10 years tax waiver to, to, to experiment his idea, his solution, so he can grow. When you grow after 10 years, he cannot begin to pay because he's going to employ his friend from the university, he's going to employ another person. So until we have growth stimulator policies, mm -hmm. everything else is just consuming. And my approach is that we don't, have, we don't need to understand everything. Our government should see innovators because they are smart people. In the last five years, Nigerian entrepreneurs have created over 10 billion markets. Flutterway, Krista, Andela, young people. 
without government support, support from, from, from America, all I'm saying that there's opportunity ahead of us. Young people are not looking for to fight with government or struggle with them. All we are looking for is an enabling environment that we can strive, we can innovate, we can create and employ our own people with a kind of a tax waiver. Why are we finding it difficult to give tax waiver, tax concessions, and an environment where we can fund our young people to create jobs? Because we cannot give a job. They don't have a job. Yes, yes, I agree. I agree with you. I agree with you, uh, and I agree that uh, Africa is the richest continent in the world uh, in, in terms of uh, raw resources, natural resources, and we all know that in Africa, uh, the, the economical uh, situation is not very good. And I agree that uh, government has to put uh, a big, a great, or a, a easiest way to make the, and to innovate for our young people. But I think that uh, the, the disruption and the innovation will come through entrepreneurs. And because and, uh, a shift of mentality, a shift of mindset too. Because even if the government puts all the, the, the procedure, all the, the regulation to improve the innovation uh, setup, I think that uh, if the mindset of the population didn't change, shifting from a begging mindset to a creative or innovative mindset, it can't work. And I think that it is our uh, our role to uh, work with this young people population, work with this young people as model, a role model, to help them shift their mindset, to help all the population to achieve the the, the, the freedom, the, the economical freedom that we are all begging uh, about. I think that it will be very great for us. Exactly, exactly. So it's very simple. I think that we have opportunity, okay, to reset mm -hmm. the, our history mm -hmm. from Kenya to to Uganda, Rwanda. Today, I'm proud. Why? Today, I can set up my business in Uganda under under five hours. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You don't need to pay anybody. But the system is working. So you, if Uganda can do it, I mean Rwanda can do it. I believe uh, Kenya can do it. All we are looking for, let me tell you something. I have had the problem I mean, across the continent. When you speak to young people, they have seen what their counterpart, because 10 years ago, of 20, 25, 20 years ago, information was not open to everybody like today. You have. Today, with your smartphone, you can talk to anybody, you can have anything. So young people know that. Look, as I'm coming out of university, my best opportunity, my best ch chances is to I mean, create something. And if you just something, India, their passport became so respected because of what? IT. Yeah. 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 Exactly. yeah. yeah. So if African government all over can just budget 1%, 0.1% of the national budget into software development and say in the next five years, we want to train 2 million software engineers, mm -hmm. we will have a lot of foreign direct inflow from, I mean, the payment will be coming in. For example, we have only have about 70,000 software engineers in Africa. The demand for talent global is increasing. So if Ghana can say, oh, we want to budget 0.1% of our budget, we want to train the next five years, we want to train 100,000 software engineers. I tell you, Ghana will not go to China to, to look for loan. Because yeah. these software engineers will work for the Google. I mean, recently, um, Clubhouse, the most popular in radio app, employ a Nigerian lady to build their um, Android version. In four months, the lady has built, the team has built Android version for Clubhouse. A Nigerian lady. Imagine if you have 10,000 of this young lady in Africa. Imagine the kind of revenue we will generate, the income they're getting. I mean, look at the Indians. All the Fortune 500 companies, are the CEOs, all the big tech guys are, are, are Indians. Why? They invested, they, they invested in IT by developing software engineers, software skills, soft skill. For the future is soft skill. So my my push and then to authorities here, um, Mr. Tete Kofi, Vanessa, um, Ellen, when you have opportunity to talk to this government, our government, our policymakers, young people have the skill, they are agile. I talk to people, we are building the same thing. I believe that only 0.1% in building software engineers, let's just build software engineers in the next five years. Let's have a million software engineers in Ghana or in Nigeria or in Kenya or in Africa. One, one more million. I tell you, 
Young people will not travel to Europe through the Mediterranean Sea. Young people will not travel to America. They will stay in Kenya, they will stay in Ghana, they will stay in Nigeria and create economic value for Africa and for the world. That's how the future should be. That's how our yes. mindset should be. Yes. The continent wealth before was oil, gold, diamond. No. Our wealth today is the young people. They are agile, okay, yes. they are smart, they are, are, are adaptable, and they are adaptable, and they are more innovative. That's the future for Africa for us to change our, our economic trajectory from, uh, from scarcity to abundance. And we need to take collaboration. As every other thing is going to be, go to be zero, but today we cannot do it all your, on, on yourself. Okay, okay, thank you very much. So I, I agree with you, and I think that blockchain will be a, a huge part of this, uh, this, this trade of, of Africa in terms of economic, because while actually, as you said, it's a decentralized thing, it's transparent, it's uh, immutably secure. And I think that uh, you are in Nigeria, I'm in Cote d'Ivoire, uh, some person are in Ghana, and we can work together to put uh, to put this blockchain on 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 a setup to make it happen in the reality, and we have to not speak alone, but we have to act. We have to act at our level to improve the the quality of life of our our, our people. I think that blockchain will be a big solution, not a panacea, but it will be a, one of the biggest solution for Africa. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Erin. I mean, you just said everything like, I mean, I'm, I'm in my mind. So I mean, the conclusion is that blockchain is an interesting technology. It's the first technology that does not have patent to any country. We all have equal access. And I can even say that a lot of Africans have, have understanding of the blockchain space, more than some people in the US, right? We have the awareness, the awareness of blockchain cryptocurrency in Africa is more than the awareness of blockchain in America. We miss an American, have had different conversations in America, they don't even know about blockchain and cryptocurrency. We have it. So all we need to do, let's collaborate. Let's invest in young people who are building solutions. This is the only way we can actually change the, the narrative in Africa about poverty. The poverty is the brain. It's not the physical. We are wealthy. We are, we, are, we are strong. We have everything. We are agile. We are resilient. All we need is being intentional to build solutions by having the backing of our government in terms of policy direction, policy direction, policy direction, by having a stimulating policy, growth policy, not stagnating waiting for this people that kill I mean seek to kill and bring other foreign people to come and view it. We don't need that. Thank you so much and uh, I'll still be here if you have any question. Thank you so much, Eric and Erin, for a great presentation. And I can see uh, so many comments in here. Some people have written um, the future is here in Africa. Yeah, um, some have written in Africa my vision to the continent to build a scarcity or to abundance. Uh, can we uh, get slides. Of course, you get slides out of this. But thank you so much for a great presentation. Can we? Can you please give me an emoji of like clapping? You know, to really celebrate a great training. Another, you could give me a celebration. But it's been a great training, and I'm sure from the beginning to the end, there's some new things that you've learned. And because of time, we really like to stay here for longer. But we have to go for a break and get ready for a second session. So once uh, this session is ended, you will go back to the uh, table. So please click a table that you're interested in network, get to know who's here, what he or she is doing, and find a way that you could collaborate in doing something good uh, through technology. Uh, otherwise, yeah, see you soon.